Thanks, James. And I just want to, uh, one bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm, I will be taking questions. Uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. Uh, as bribery, I uh, brought homemade bread that, that I baked in my uh, oven, my, my wood-fired pizza oven in the backyard at my house. So uh, anyone who asks a question is entitled to a, a slice of bread. Um, for anyone who cares about allergies, it is 100% whole wheat and does contain dairy, um, but no eggs or anything else. So. Um, Without further ado, uh, so we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about uh, PaaS security. Um, there's been, it's been referenced quite a bit today uh, in the earlier panels, and it keeps coming up again and again online and in the various other conferences. So I thought I'd uh, give you a little bit of a conversation about it. And really, you know, th this comes down to uh, two major categories of concerns. Uh, one is sort of policy process, you know, oriented issues, and then there's technology issues. I'm going to actually start off with the uh, process side of things first, and then we'll dive into the technology aspect for the second half of the talk. So, you know, obviously the question is, you know, why do people do PaaS? Uh, fast, easy deployment, that's always a good thing. You just put the code in, it goes, magic happens, and your app is up and running. Awesome. One of the biggest complaints that I hear about DevOps and PaaS in particular, this whole thing is, oh my God, <laughs> It's the end of the world. We have lost separation of duties. We're going to violate security things right, left, and center. How will we control things? And I say, who cares? Honestly, okay, I'm a security guy. I really, this does not violate separation of duties. Uh, everyone tells you when you go to security school and you're in Security 101 that the main purpose of separation of duties is to ensure that developers don't sneak back doors into the code. And, and you know what? You don't look at the code when you deploy it if you're the ops person and the devs hand you the code. You just say, okay, and you deploy it. So you actually have no idea what's going on. The reality is that separation of duties is about change control and change management. And pause does not break that. That's an important thing to realize is this stuff all gets logged somewhere. And as a security person, you can look at those logs as an ops person, you can look at those logs, and the main goal here of separation of duties is to actually understand what happened in the case of something breaking. And something will break. Something breaks every day. Uh, in fact, if you're doing DevOpsy type stuff well, it's going to break more often, and that's good. Adrian can probably even talk more about why that's good, and I'll talk a little bit more later on why that's good. But in general, you know, you, when things break, oh well, they, they break, and that's fine, because if you break them well, then you don't break things overall, unless you're doing like Dave's picture earlier where you have uh, badness, that middle picture. Doesn't even look like a very good beverage at that point, does it? Then on the plus side, you get automation. Automation makes everything better. Uh, you don't want to automate everything. Hey, someone likes automation. I was surprised. There should be more of you liking automation. Automation is great. Uh, we can talk about automation for the win. We can talk about automate everything. You don't need to automate everything, just the, the boring stuff. The thing, you know, the thing here is that if you want to create a nice big security vulnerability, do everything by hand. That's when you're going to screw something up. If you want to avoid security problems, automate it. You know, computers are great at doing the same thing over and over and over again the exact same way. If you're going to screw up, at least screw up consistently. Make sure you introduce the same problem everywhere, because it's a lot easier to understand what broke if it's consistent. If you have if you mainly deploy your code to five servers and something is not working right, good luck figuring out which one's the right one, if any of them are, and which ones are the bad ones. So at least if you did it centrally, it's all the same. And I hear people, you know, a lot of people say, well, what if, I, what if it breaks? Well, what if it breaks? You deploy your patches automatically. You don't manually install patches, security patches. You don't manually update your antivirus. It's the same thing. It's just scarier when it's something you don't understand. And actually, I have to say, that's pretty much security people in general. Uh, we fear change, we fear things we don't understand. Um, and so we need to get over that because just because you don't understand doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it's different. So the other reason to, do, you know, to use pause is obviously consistent deployment. I talked a little bit about that already. already. Um, the more consistently it deploys, the more likely it is to at least, it makes troubleshooting easier, but also it means that when, uh, if you build it in the same deployment, in dev and test and stage and production, even if it's a smaller version before production, you're more likely to see something break than when everything's ever so slightly differently. I can't tell you how many times uh, in my ops sort of past that I've worked with you know, an organization and they say, it worked great in dev and then they push it to production 
and it broke, and it turns out that things were slightly differently, and controls were slightly different, and oh, by the way, there's firewall rules in production that are not in place in dev, so suddenly things just weren't working. So in general, this is a good thing. There's no real security complaints at all about this that I can think of. If anyone disagrees, feel free to uh, give me an example, but I've, I've, I spent a lot of time trying to find a, a, a counter reason not to like consistent deployment. Hides the, you know, pause is great. It hides the complexity of what's going on in the background. And from a dev perspective, that's great. You can concentrate on your code, get that code out, do your job. From an ops perspective, it's great. You push out that pause deployment or you're using a public pause. You don't have to worry about the complexity for the most part. Security people hate complexity because it makes it harder to understand what's going on. And more importantly, it freaks you out when you don't understand what's going on. And so, and again, this is, this is a constant theme with security people. We're like, oh my god, it's the end of the world. And it's like, no, it's not the end of the world. It's just different. I noticed you didn't have that big complaint when you wanted to buy the latest new security widget that you didn't understand. We like saying no a lot. And that's one of the reasons I'm a bad security people. Because I say, sure, go ahead, do it. What's the worst thing that can happen? This is the more compelling reason not to use PaaS. Uh, particularly in a public environment, which is that there's a lot of compliance and regulatory and legal issues out there, some of which don't specifically, they don't explicitly allow PaaS, they don't explicitly allow cloud, and this scares people. They're like, okay, legal department's like, well, we're not sure if we're allowed to do that, or in case of PSA, we don't have guidance until very recently around cloud, so we're not sure if we can actually do, safely do a, PA, you know, a, a cloud deployment in this environment because we don't understand multi-tenancy and the regulations or the legislation don't explicitly permit it, so we better not do it. It's better safe than sorry. And you hear about this a lot in terms of privacy legislation. Um, how do you know where your data is going? Um, I'll give you a hint. If your PaaS provider or your cloud provider is only located in one country, the odds of it leaving the country, by that, the, the odds of that cloud provider moving to the country are really low. It just doesn't happen. Um, and even if it's multi-country, Amazon doesn't just say, I know we're gonna move data for you automatically. You know, they charge you for that kind of thing. <laughs> and so they want to, they, they, you know, they don't mind if you move it, but they expect to get paid for that as a service. They don't just magically say, oh, well, we'll just migrate it over to China for you. Um, or we'll move it from Ireland to the US and violate European data directive for you. No, you have to do that yourself. You wanna break the law, your pause provider is not gonna do it for you. Uh, and lastly, in this situation, Auditors just, really honestly, they don't understand the new technology, and they're paid to be even more conservative than security people. Their job is to take a piece of legislation or governance from an organization, say, do you meet the letter of these rules? And as soon as you add any variation to those rules, it makes them very uncomfortable. It makes them even more uncomfortable than security people because their, bus their businesses can go away uh, in certain situations um, if they're not careful. So they tend to be super conservative, you know, there was a point 10 years ago where you couldn't use an automated vulnerability scanner and hand it to your, to your auditors for a SOX audit. They would say, we don't know, we don't trust that. We need to do our tests manually. Now they all use Qualys or Foundstone or some other service. And so part of this is just you need to, you know, if your auditors are concerned, you need to work with them to help them understand how these technologies work so you can actually do this. Um, on the regulatory front and sort of related to auditors, again, is when you start dealing with certain kinds of legislation, particularly privacy, when you get into healthcare, virtualization freaks auditors out a lot, again, because they need to understand how those controls work. So they, they are confident in signing off, saying you're doing the right things, especially when you get into things like healthcare data, because the fines for violations are quite high. The good news is that HIPAA, in particular, is very descriptive and not very prescriptive at all, which means that as long as you have a good story about how you were trying to do security, you'll probably get out from having fines, which is kind of awesome. But you better have a good story showing how you are taking reasonable precautions that any other company would take, and ideally more than reasonable precautions, so that way you can tell health and human services, hey look, we're top, you know, we're, we're best of class, we're doing good things here, so, because you'll have a breach. I don't know of a single organization that hasn't had a breach yet. It just, they may not, they may not know it themselves either, but you know, if you're an decent decent-sized, you've had an issue, and that's fine, okay. So now that we, have, we get to the technical side of things, and this is a, this is a fun one. So this, this, I broke this down into three categories, sort of the security provided by the pause itself, the security that 
the ops folks can do, the, the security operations folks can do, and the security that the, product, that the developers who are putting stuff onto the pause can do. And these all play together. Now, I actually, have a, actually had a conversation earlier today on Twitter during one of the earlier panels about container security. And uh, I was talking with someone, and they were, they were feeling very adamantly that LXC, which is uh, the Linux container service, uh, it's available by default on most distributions of Linux, was not secure enough, and that you should use something like SE Linux. Um, I think SE Linux actually adds more security issues than it removes. It certainly adds a lot of operational concerns. It's a very complex product to add. Um, and one of the things to realize uh, about this is that, to date, there have been dozens, maybe hundreds, of publicly shared exploits against applications running on cloud providers. And this is documented in things like the Verizon Reach Report, the TrustWave Reach Report, a handful of others. Um, there's not been one publicly or even semi-publicly documented case of someone breaching the cloud provider's security at the hypervisor or container level. Not a single one. And the, the reality behind this is that this is challenging stuff to break. And I'll talk a bit more about this uh, in terms of some risk modeling we're gonna do later on in the conversation here. But this stuff is really hard to break. And frankly, apps are really easy to break. You know, looking for SQL injection, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, things like this, every application has them. It's really hard to avoid. And so as a result, you look at the uh, vulnerability stats of, of, ex of successful exploits, and it comes down to two things, SQL injection or compromising the client to get access to the data they're trying to get to using Trojans or malware, things like that. No one is exploiting ex outside of the lab these sorts of hypervisor technologies because it's, it's really hard and you're not gonna burn that kind of exploit on just going after someone's web app data when you can get it via easier mechanisms. So, um, well, yes, these are vulnerable. All these things, Warden is relatively new. Um, it's a later weight container system. Docker just went open source last week, I think it was, maybe the week before. Um, so honestly, I haven't had a chance to really dig deeper than the, the, the docs. I'm not quite sure all the details on how, it, how it's doing its thing, though I do know it leverages LXC and some of the other um, available default uh, kernel level protections that Linux can do. Uh, SE Linux, again, um, it's out there. Every organization I know that uses something with SE Linux, the first thing they do after starting up the system is disable SE Linux. Um, in, a, in, in an ideal world, it's this, it's this technology that lets you highly restrict what users can do, what processes can do, and it's really cool. It's also insanely difficult to manage and to deploy well. And your odds are that you can actually uh, be overly restrictive. The defaults are insane. And unless you've spent in, in, uh, an extraordinary amount of time and effort on this thing, you're just not going to do it right the first time, and probably not even right the first 20 times. Um, and so what you're doing is you're spending a lot of time and effort and adding a lot of complexity to your environment for not a lot of added benefit. If you really are seriously concerned about someone breaking your container, you're probably already doing a lot of monitoring and analysis of your environment anyway, so focus more effort on the monitoring side. Don't uh, add complexity to your environment. If you, the more complexity you add, the harder it is to make your environment composable. Uh, it's harder to make it, you know, keep the entry, it's harder to keep you know, these, these complexity issues, you know, the complexity issues are actually um, fighting, you're, you're actually creating unnecessary, uh, unwanted complexity, and uh, so that's bad. And it really makes it harder to audit, harder to support, and uh, for very little benefit, when instead what you can do is, rather than applying, as I think I said on Twitter earlier, a Band-Aid laced with broken glass, what you can do is monitor what you should already be doing anyway, and work from there. Um, some of the uh, pause services out there, uh, most notably uh, Google App Engine, but a bunch of other folks as well, have uh, taken a whitelisting approach, which you could use SE Linux for, that's the theory at least, but the idea is they say, here are the library calls for the Java standard library you're allowed to use. Anything else that's on that whitelist is, uh, is not allowed. Uh, some other folks are going to blacklisting approach. Uh, I spoke with the folks from uh, Apprenda earlier this, uh, actually late last week, and that's the approach they do. Other folks allow this as well. And the idea is that you pick out the specific library calls or system calls that you are concerned about from a security perspective and you just ban them. And as a result, even if the developer writes code that calls those libraries, it just doesn't run. It just doesn't go. And so that's a nice way of adding some security uh, to your environment. Uh, and that's not so much for protecting 
the pause itself as is to help ensure that you're not generating vulnerable applications to begin with. Now, this is where security people tend to get very uncomfortable. This is, this is our domain. You, know, you take an application, in this case it's the pause environment, and you say, I need to add some security to this. What security controls can I add? Um, as a general rule, in the public pause space, there's not a lot you can do because you have no control. This is just like any cloud service as you move from infrastructure up the stack to software as a service, you get less and less control over what's going on. Um, in this case, you're pretty much limited to third-party services like Cloudflare and the like where you can essentially act as a, uh, excuse me, as a proxy as a service for adding some security functionality onto your applications. Um, in the private, obviously in the private pause space, you have a lot more control because you actually control where components go, so you can start sliding either virtual or physical technology services in between the layers, just like you would do with any other uh, system. One of the, the questions to, you, know, you have to ask, start asking yourself when you're trying to figure out, uh, should you use PaaS, and if you are using PaaS, should you use it in a public environment or a private environment, is what are your requirements for things like cryptography, uh, in both in terms of network transmission, behind the web server. Uh, most folks can get away with only with terminating SSL at the web server and everything behind uh, the web server being transmitted in clear text. Other fo you know, but for certain legislation stuff, uh, it's, uh, it makes people uncomfortable to have that. They want encrypto all the way back to the database. Um, if that's the case, then public pause isn't for you. Uh, but you can probably, you can do that in a private pause environment. Similarly, if you need an encrypted file system, that's really hard to do in a public PaaS environment. I haven't found one yet that supports uh, encrypted file systems in a public space. Again, obviously, if you're in the private space, you can, you can add this functionality yourself or work with your provider to do that. Very few folks, I have not found a private PaaS player explicitly yet who, will, who supports that out of the box. Um, but again, there's some tricks you can play, uh, particularly if uh, you're using SAN or NAS type storage, you can actually encrypt the file system before it actually gets passed off to the, the PaaS platform at all. And in that case, the PaaS platform is completely uh, out of the loop on that thing. So that's one way of addressing that. Um, there's the whole logging auditing thing. This is, uh, you know, obviously there's two aspects to this is, you know, one is, does your application generate the right kind of logs for doing that sort of analysis? The answer is hopefully yes. Uh, but what logging does the uh, PaaS uh, provider provide either on the public or private side? Does it give you sufficient logging and auditing, alerting, et cetera, to, uh, to meet your compliance, regulatory, governance, blah, blah, blah needs? Um, and related to that um, is, actually I was just talking with uh, James and Casey before the talk and I realized the bullet point I forgot to add is incident response here. This is a big one is where do, when you start running in a PaaS environment and a security issue comes up, how does incident response work? Where do you draw the lines? And this isn't so much a, um, a security concern in the sense of, oh my God, it's not there. This is, you need to make sure ahead of time you understand where, the you know, where that line gets drawn, what's the provider responsible for, what are you responsible for. If that pause provider is sitting on top of another uh, you know, cloud service like Amazon, what's Amazon responsible for? What's the pause provider responsible for? What are you responsible for? You really want to have those, uh, those concerns delineated ahead of time. Same thing in the, uh, in the private pause environment, there was some discussion uh, in an early panel of patch management, someone claimed that the PaaS provider would you know, notify you in case uh, there was you know, security concerns with the components. I certainly hope that's the case. Uh, you probably want to know ahead of time what, those you know, what that PaaS provider's policies are on notification, when they notify, what their process and timelines are for addressing those security concerns. Um, just so you can make an intelligent, informed decision of whether that is sufficient for your needs. Um, certainly, uh, it's going to depend a lot on what kind of applications you're writing, what your compliance concerns, and things like that. And again, I talked about this a bit earlier on the policy side. Compliance causes all sorts of potential issues, so just make sure you understand what, how that all plays together. So like PCI, for instance, that's uh, one that comes up again and again, mandates that uh, the entire stack from the physical data center it sits in through the actual web-based application needs to be certified compliant which means that if you're you know, deploying a PaaS on an infrastructure as a service provider, that infrastructure as a service provider needs to be assessed PCI compliant, and if it's a PaaS provider on top of that infrastructure as a service provider, they need to be certified, and if you're building your own and you have to deal with credit card data, you better make sure that you go through the appropriate uh, processes. It's not sufficient just to say, well, Amazon's certified, so I'm good to go. I, I can just throw credit card numbers up there on Amazon. Um, 
So just understand where that goes. Um, certainly, if you're dealing with enough credit card data, you start getting into things like needing uh, hardware security modules for your certificates, uh, which thanks to certain people in this room are now available from Amazon. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to name names, so I won't, but uh, nonetheless, there's now some functionality there that lets you do that. Um, particularly if you're writing your own PaaS environment, that's something to think about. And now, sort of, this is a big one. So one of the things that we got going on here is that because there's very little security functionality at the PaaS layer, I mean, there's some things going on there, but it's not super hardcore. The, the PaaS isn't, as a general rule, providing security functionality above and beyond the actual container. And you're, especially in the public environment, your third party ability to add security controls is also fairly minimal. It comes down to um, that essentially all your security doesn't come in the application itself. So your developers need to be able to write secure code. Fortunately, there's a lot of tools out there for helping out. Obviously, in the Java side, there's things like Find Bugs and their friends. Uh, Ruby has similar ones. Um, Find Bugs has a very small set, like 20 or 30 security oriented unit tests. Uh, there's a, a, you know, you should be writing your own security tests, uh, unit test integration tests. And uh, Jenkins is a great tool on the continuous uh, integration, continuous deployment front, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Um, this Build Security In is a uh, great, great resource from uh, US CERT for just some great tools around uh, for some tools and some lessons about writing secure code, deploying secure web applications, it's great stuff. Um, but one of the most important things to do is to do threat modeling so you can actually do a, a appropriate risk assessment over um, what your application is doing and where the security concerns may lie. Um, as you start doing this, you can identify a whole lot of potential security concerns, but you wanna make sure that you're prioritizing these things appropriately. So threat modeling is a great way to do that. Um, I'm fond of Microsoft's model of Stride, which uh, looks at these, you know, these six main categories. Uh, spoofing is where someone is pretending to be, you know, I'm pretending to be James, or James is pretending to me on the application side. Tampering is actually, you know, altering data without authorization. Repudiation is that concern where a, uh, you know, a purchase gets made on Amazon, and Amazon wants to know that it was actually a legitimate pur purchase. Um, and the ability for a user not to be able to say that, oh, I didn't purchase that. I really, you know, so obviously information disclosure is a popular one. You see a lot about data leaking, data getting lost, uh, denial of service. There's been, that's been in the news a lot in the last uh, few days with the whole uh, Cloudflare uh, spam house thing. And of course, uh, elevation of privilege where you manage to exceed whatever application controls are in place and get more access than you should to certain kinds of data, which then can let you do things, everything from tampering to information disclosure or potentially even denial of service. So now the cool thing is there's a great game uh, that actually Microsoft put out. It's called uh, Elevation of Privilege. Uh, Adam Shostak created, it's actually available, uh, Creative Commons. And it's actually, it's a card game you can play, that developers can play with or without security people to help identify security issues, potential security issues, and come up with a path for uh, managing and mitigating those issues. Um, there's the URL for it. You can, uh, most events that Microsoft shows up at that have any security uh, bent to them at all, they have decks available for free, or you can download. It's all Creative Commons, so you can actually download it and print your own cards, add your own cards um, as you see fit. The other thing is to just really embrace the whole DevOps continuous integration and continuous deployment model. There's been some great research um, that came out, actually the date on that first one, the Woodward paper is actually 1979, not 2009. Uh, so off by about 30 years there, sorry about that. Um, so this was a very cool paper um, out of IBM from some research done in 1979, as I said, that demonstrated that for every amount of complexity you added to an application design, you exponentially made your code more complex. So there's a, uh, and so you work backwards from this, what you discover is that you're far better off making a series of small changes, uh, both to your specification, which means to a series of smaller code changes, um, and your code becomes more stable, more secure, um, and less complex. Um, so definitely, so this was called, this was back in 1979. Sandy Clark, uh, uh, also known as Mouse, is working with Matt Blaze. She has a paper coming out that actually replicated uh, IBM's research using um, 
publicly available data on vulnerabilities found in Firefox. And since it's uh, the very first release, they went through and looked at the types of vulnerabilities that came out and how much, code, how much the code changed and looked at how fast, you know, at uh, the ease of, uh, of making fixes and things like that. That paper's coming out hopefully later this year, if not early next year. In general, the idea is, you know, every time someone, you know, commits code, you build it, you test it, and um, look for security issues along with all the other issues. Um, the great thing there is you very quickly identify when security issues come up or any other sorts of issues, um, and that way you're only trying to fix a small set of lines of code, you know, as opposed to, you know, maybe anywhere from five to 50 lines of code or more, as opposed to thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of lines of code all at once. So you want to build often, you want to test just as often as you build. Uh, there are uh, open source tools for this. There's commercial tools for this. There's a whole slew of them out there. That's probably a talk, that's a talk in and of itself. Now there's some really cool uh, stuff. Now, the, the good news, some good news and bad news on, on the vulnerability front. Uh, so back in 2006, uh, Osmond and Schechter at MIT at the time, they're now at Microsoft Research, came out with a paper. They looked at uh, one of the BSD variants and found that 60% of the vulnerabilities in the code as of 2006 were foundational. 60% of the vulnerable code that they found was in the very first release of that BSD release. I can't remember if it was FreeBSD or OpenBSD. Um, and the, the, the takeaway from this paper was is that security issues are intrinsic. Like, vulnerabilities are hiding there in the code, and they're probably there from the very beginning. Uh, but then uh, a few years later, uh, Matt Blaze, Sandy Clark, and friends released a paper called The Honeymoon Effect. And what they found actually is that security, that what the things that lead to security, vulnerab security vulnerabilities being discovered is that uh, there has to be an extrinsic reason to do it. There has to be an outside reason in, you know, above and beyond that there's vulnerabilities there uh, that drive people to actually find these vulnerabilities and discover them. And so it's not so much how old the vulnerability is, is but how relevant it is. And the other thing they found was is that the largest gap, the largest period of time in an application's life cycle where there is no vulnerabilities announced is actually the time from when the software is initially released to the first uh, bug being announced. That's the long period. So it's a very long tail in, in the curve. Um, and so that's a, it, its own interesting thing. And uh, related to this, so that the year before, uh, Alex Hutton, who runs Risk at Zion's Bank and I, uh, released a, a thought model at Black Hat, which we uh, cleverly called the Mortman Hutton model because we weren't feeling very creative that day. And what our, our, what our claim is in this model, and this is really, this is a risk management threat modeling thought process. This, these curves are made, are completely made up. These are not driven by actual, any actual data. It's just an idea. The original th idea behind this was is you're the CISO at a company, you're in charge of engineering whatever, and you hear about a new vulnerability, whether in your own product or in a third party product you use, how do you decide whether to address this, pro this issue or not? And our general claim is that um, the, excuse me, the vulnerability life cycle of a product or technology roughly follows a Gartner hype cycle curve. So that's the black curve right there. You know, new technology gets announced, uh, you know, some, a bunch of er, low-hanging vulnerabilities get, get discovered and announced, and then, you know, people say, okay, we've, we found a bunch of, we've, we've solved these problems, we found these vulnerabilities, and at that point, uh, you know, the really easily identifiable stuff gets dealt with, and then it's the point where you have to put a lot of time and effort into finding vulnerabilities in this stuff. And so kind of drop, the vulnerabilities, uh, you know, timeline drops off in that, that, you know, classic Gartner trough of disillusionment, but as technology, as the technology matures and as you get out there and use that technology more and more, people get more time with it, and eventually the rate of vulnerability starts climbing back up. The red line there, the red line is, is roughly the shape of, so, of, of how software tends to be picked up by enterprises, by the public at large, with a few exceptions, the generally, you know, it has a very slow ramp up, and then you get this sort of steep uptake, and then it kind of levels off because enough people are starting to use it. So when you start, when you read about a vulnerability, a, cl a new class of vulnerabilities, or you're in an organization and you find, you know, you get emails saying, "Oh, there's a uh, there's a new Java vulnerability, or there's a new Rails vulnerability," you have to say to you, the couple questions you want to ask yourself is, well, one is, is my organization using this technology? And if it is using this technology, how much is it using it? And that's that red curve. And then you want to also think about, well, where is this technology on the vulnerability hype cycle? And that sort of green area, and actually anywhere to the right of that green area, is where the technology is relatively in high use, and 
the vulnerability, the ability of attackers to understand that technology and exploit it is also relatively high. And that's when you start getting into the area where you really care, is that, that sort of green area, and actually the area to the right of the green area, where, the t where these problems, where you really want to say, oh my god, I really need to deal with this. Um, so case in point, uh, what, a month, two months ago, there was, the big, there was a huge Ruby on Rails vulnerability. And everyone's like, oh my god, it's the end of the internet again, another security vulnerability. Um, in my organization, we don't use Ruby on Rails. So I was like, oh well, I don't need to worry about that. That was a very easy risk assessment. Um, on the other hand, I was talking with Alex, and you know, pretty much every time there's a new Internet Explorer vulnerability, they're seeing, uh, you know, this is this be the far right end of the curve, you know, over here, way out here on both the black and the red lines. And in fact, uh, every time there's a new vulnerability on in Internet Explorer or some other, you know, like or or. Uh, say, Flash, that's another good one, it'll be Flash, um, they're actually seeing exploit attempts in less than 24 hours after the exploit is publicly known. Everyone's just jumping on them, they're easy to reverse engineer, and so you have to figure out where on these curves does your organization lie with these technologies, how much do you need to worry about it, and then you can help deal with, it, with uh, stuff that way. Okay, so here's you know, the sort of the, uh, my final takeaways here. Uh, Platform isolation, it looks pretty good. Are there security issues? Sure. Are the security issues enough to want to start applying a lot of extra controls on top of it, aside from money? No, not really. There's easier ways for people to break stuff, so don't add complexity. Don't worry about it. Uh, the side effects of PaaS are, are really compelling. Obviously, we're all here. Otherwise, uh, otherwise we, we agree with that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Be careful when you start dealing with compliance. That's a big one. This is where you can get bit. Uh, on the public path side, you're very limited on third-party tools, so take that into careful consideration. And in general, remember this is a uh, this just highlights yet again that uh, the place to be putting a lot of effort is not in third-party tools, regardless of your environment, but making sure your code is solid and to begin with, and then you don't need the the, uh, the other effects are less uh, are less relevant. And tools like de concepts like DevOps, continuous integration, continuous deployment, etc., are uh, really help a lot. Other questions? Brad? I was promised heckling, Caroline, and there was no heckling. Whew, I'm lucky. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Yes. I'm sorry? The title of the talk? Ah. Uh, uh, um, so, yeah, so the, the, the talk was titled, um, here we go, let's cover your paths. Um, about, uh, I guess about a year ago now, uh, there was a whole thing on Twitter about a, a small group of people calling themselves the, the, the Paz Holes, and I thought, I thought it'd be fun to uh, do a little play on words on that. So I originally titled this talk, uh, Cover Your Paz Holes, but it was pointed out to me by several people that it wasn't actually as funny as Cover Your Paz, so it's now Cover Your Paz instead of Cover, instead. Thank you.